thank you guys for having uh, me here today. So today I will uh, preview on our work, our journey towards achieving human parity on a Chinese English translation. That work that done uh, through the last year, it was great collaboration uh, between our team in Redmond and uh, our team that MSRA in China. The paper and archive with more details, but I will just preview on some uh, parts that we have achieved on that work. So I start with uh, that sketchy timeline from Chris Manning. Uh, he introduced two years ago some very sketchy timeline for machine translation. Machine translation has been a dream for decades till mid uh, 90s when it got some post using uh, information theory approaches st statistical machine translation introduced by IBM. And then it was a decade later when mainstream machine translation in around 2005 became mainstream phrase-based translation and that enabled big player like Google, Microsoft, IBM and other to ship uh, like uh, systems, large scale systems at that time. And it remains li such like that for a decade or more with some syntactic based information here and there. But you can tell that it is a machine translation output and totally uh, uh, recognizable by human that it is a machine translation output. It wasn't until 2014 when the new wave of neural machine translation arrived. At that time, no one at the people actually working on machine translation paid any attention to neural MT. And they thought it would maybe take 10 years to get into mainstream and overtake the phrase-based system. But eventually, just a year or two years, at around 2016, it was the mainstream uh, approach uh, took over the state of the art on phrase-based system and uh, became even the mainstream for all online shipped system by all the big players in the translation industry. So uh, we, at that time, last year, we had a question, what is now the state of the art? How far we are from human performance using machine translation? Are we far or are we close to that? Second, how we can measure that? The problem with measuring machine translation uh, quality, as you may know, it is very hard to measure it compared to humans. We measure it using blue score, which using in the grams overlaps, measuring it towards the human, how far the human is doing towards the translation quality is quite a challenging uh, task. So uh, we tried to answer both questions. And as Google uh, had uh, their uh, paper at 2016, they said they are approaching human level translation with like a sketchy uh, evaluation. So we tried further to evaluate how we measure the actual human evaluation and how to push the state of the art further. Our Project internal code name was Project Pabel, and by March this year, we got into the level of human parity, as I will explain uh, here. So we can add some more sketchy to the timeline here. I hope Chris Manning wouldn't mind, but he's okay. So yeah, so I will start with like an ever overview for the current state of the art of neural machine translation, followed by the contribution that we did uh, to reach that level, and then the human evaluation uh, we defined and evaluated our systems on. Yeah. So first, the encoder decoder for neural machine translation is the mainstream approach now for machine translation. In the older day with phrase-based translation, we used to chunk the source into pieces. Like we have the sentence like that, and we turn it into phrases. And from those phrases, we start to use some translation rules, learn it somehow, constructing the target. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of problems putting pieces back together. And from there, phrase-based SMT usually had disfluent output. On the encoder-decoder, at least the recent representation for the encoder-decoder architecture, uh, we try to have a full sentence representation on the encoder side. And from that, we try to produce the target word by word, autoregressive or not, but at least we use the whole sentence representation from the encoder. At the beginning, the first 
uh, actual embodiment for such encoder decoder architecture proposed around 2014 with using recurrent network. In that, we start by defining an RNN, typically LSTM, on each word, and then we progress sequence to sequence, word by word, to produce a sentence representation. And sentence representation is the actual one at the end of the sentence. Then we use that to uh, initialize another target language model to produce words word by word. At that time, it was very surprising, actually, that this approach worked at all. And I recall that we have been talking about how this can work. It is very trivial. And we have like 10 years of feature engineering to get such translation. So this can't work. But even analyzing the output, we found it works quite well in short sentence, working quite bad on long sentence. Um, but at least at the same time, uh, people working on the actual large scale machine translation systems didn't uh, take it in serious way and thought it may not be that uh, 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 state of the art till maybe five or ten years to go. Uh, short time after that, sooner, very sooner after that, uh, the limitation of very long sentence was the main uh, problem for uh, solving that uh, limitation then the attention-based encoder-decoder has been introduced. For attention-based uh, decoder-decoder approach, uh, here we don't have a single representation for the whole sentence, but we have variable representation, depending on the word you are translating. And that could like, uh, relax the problem with very longer sentence, because whatever word you are translating, you can reference the representation on the source sentence step by step. And I consider that is the main breakthrough that enabled neural machine translation generally to work. So we start with some bidirectional RNN, and then we calculate the similarity between some target word that we are translating and all uh, uh, source context. And this similarity ended up to get us a weight. We can normalize those weights and they end up with a flexible representation across the whole uh, sentence for that particular role. And we keep doing that in autoregressive way. Um, but at that time, that uh, actually overtook the phrase-based translation system and was the mainstream uh, uh, state of the art. And shorter after that, it was even for all online systems by Google, Microsoft, and other was using that RNN-based approach. Uh, eventually, people thought that okay, RNN is very, very uh, efficient very good at representing variable lengths, attention helping a lot there. There are few limitations. Mainly, it is very hard to parallelize, especially at training time, because you have to follow the computation step by step, sequence by sequence. And similar other approaches, still following encoder-decoder architecture, starts to evolve, mainly using convolutional network by uh, Facebook Fair and Google ByteNet and WebNet. All of those approaches try to make it easier to parallelize because convolutional are independent of each other and can be computed all together without waiting for the sequence. But uh, it needs a lot of layers to go through the uh, uh, very deep architecture to be able to represent the long sequence. The third wave of neural machine translation that has been proposed last year is a transformer model, or attention is all you need, uh, by Google Brain team. And that is very, very uh, simple and intuitive at the same time. Instead of having a sequence to represent your, uh, your uh, encoder or decoder, what about using only the attention, only the similarity score between any two words anywhere? And that is, uh, you can represent any uh, representation it's quadratic on the length of the uh, source or the target, and you can have multiple layers of those. Um, let us see, yeah, this is very nice visualization here. Uh, so imagine that is the encoder side, and then we do all attention, self-attention calculation, computing all scores, similarity between source words. And that is, can be very parallelizable. Then we start with decoding, and at decoding time, we start to compute the uh, scores of attention between source and target. Then even we uh, score the attention by the decoder itself 
on the left side only. As you can see here, all those uh, computation can be done uh, uh, in parallel because you don't wait for anything. At the encoder side, all the self-attention computation on the encoder can be done in just two matrices. Multiplied together, that will give us the dot product of the scores of layer by layer, and so on. So it is very easy to parallelize, very efficient at training time. Not at decoding time, but at training, because at training you can have a lot of those large uh, matrices, load them, and keep doing that computation. So each one of those uh, dots can be represented on uh, that uh, block. And uh, again, we'll start with the inputs, and then we have on the encoder side, we don't know where is the position coming from. So we have to add some positional information, and that is non-parametric sinusoidal positional encoding. And then we we'll start on the uh, source by multi-head attention, that is calculating the uh, attention on all source words, followed by a residual uh, layer, then a normalization, layer normalization. After that, we have a positional feed forward network. That is one layer only. We have like typically six of those. Then we have the decoder, very similar, other than we have multi-head masked attention to avoid looking to the right because at runtime we don't know the future yet, so it has to be masked. Second, we have to have the uh, yeah we have to have uh, the multi-head attention between the source and target together, and those are six layers again. The main difference between the uh, transformer attention only need models and all other models is that. Attention based model is not positional based. We don't know the position other than it is in the added to the embeddings here. Other than that, we can compute any representation very, very flexible. Uh, on RNN or CNN, RNN is very sequential. CNN is partially sequential because you have the scope of the coordinates that go layer by layer. Here in attention, it is just very flexible and it is the representation is totally based on the content of each representation. For that, we can see that it can model a lot of the language characteristics that we had seen uh, to be very hard on RNN, like even gender agreement or, or long range dependency. Well, the RNN can also encode the position, right? You can provide an input in the input layer for the RNN. But yeah, but even it is inherited by the architecture itself because each computation is based on the previous one and next one. So, right, you so uh, what is the extra advantage um, are we giving from this? It's, it's so there, is, there is this advantage that you don't have the position accuracy. It's not advantage. You don't have position knowledge here at all. For first, we adding it here as positional encoder, or they had added it as positional encoding to just compensate for not having any knowledge about the position. But the flexibility there is that you don't, uh, you don't have to depend on the sequence to calculate any dependency between a word here and a word 30 words away from that. Other than you depend for uh, it depends on the gates and how far you can propagate the dependency that far. Maybe eventually it is not that important. Here it is very focused. You just calculate every word with every other word and you get a score. And that score represents if really that verb is depending on that subject because there is some gender agreement that I need to produce or not. And that is just the content space scoring, not the sequence uh, mechanism. Still, that is disadvantage that you don't have, uh, sorry, that you don't have a, a, a explicit positional encoder. But even we tried that, the sinusoidal one that provides the paper, and we tried actual position. It is, both of them are OK. It is not that. Uh, is not that bad. So we move ahead to see what we, uh, our contribution that helped in achieving state-of-the-art results. So we explored three different uh, areas that we thought it may be a limitation of the current uh, uh, at least uh, uh, paradigms. And we tried many, many other than that. Most of them didn't work. So I just highlight the things that work is here, <laughs> as you can imagine. So uh, first thing we try to uh, explore, uh, machine translation is very dual problem. In other ways, 
we are translating from, for example, Chinese to English. At the same time, we can be translating from English to Chinese. We don't explore how those two systems that mathematically are very correlated because they are representing the same joint probability can help each other. First, we can have the Chinese system translate to English, and we can have the English system translate to Chinese, and how we can uh, uh, like make use of the signals between both of them as rewards or as better uh, loss function to capitalize on that. Just to have some contrast with the more popular approach on, trans, uh, on neural machine translation, which is back translation, very simple, very efficient, and we are using it as well. Uh, so in back translation, we start from bilingual data, then you train a reverse system from English to Chinese, for example. And then you produce some uh, artificial training data, augment that with the original data, retrain your system, and usually you get some good gain using the monolingual corpus. The assumption here is that uh, neural machine translation is actually less sensitive to the noise in the source than the noise in the target. So your targets tell monolingual good sentences. Even if the source is a little bit noisy, it can go through because the encoder is not that sensitive to the variation there. So it helps a lot, and we are using that. But uh, on the dual view, you have more, more advantages there. First, you don't propagate the errors. In other way, if you produce bad sentence in the back translation, it will affect the system badly. Here in the dual model, no. The other system, other direction will give you a score, how bad or good it is. Then there's some credit. It will not be that bad for affecting the system. The second, you can here optimize the model in both directions, source target, target source. In back translation, it is always going from source target and using only monolingual English corpus. In the duality, you can use monolingual corpus in both English, Chinese, source and target, train both systems together. Uh, moreover, you can do that on semi-supervised uh, semi, uh, or semi-supervised way, as we'll explore later on. We are using both approaches. Both are helpful, complementary, but they are different. Uh, in uh, duality, the more, I think, uh, super uh, set back translation is uh, one instance of the dual problem that is restricting some of the capabilities. So how we can explore the duality first, the dual unsupervised learning. In the dual unsupervised learning, we have unsupervised data, mainly uh, source data on the English side, for example, if we are translating from English to Chinese, and target on the target side, both are monolingual. Then we start simply by translating the sentence X here into from English to Chinese using some model during training that is iterative. And then we end up with some proposed Y approach. Does this have a pointer? Maybe. No. Pointer doesn't work on the screen. That's okay, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So um, first we take the sentence from X, produce a Y translation. Then we take the Y translation back through the other direction system, produce X prime. And here we have started with X. After round trip, we have X prime. Both of them should represent the same sentence. If we are not able to reconstruct the sentence, then we should penalize both systems accordingly. Then that is the signal, the reconstruction signal, which is the difference between X and X prime. Uh, moreover, we can use post-language model, train on monolingual data and source, monolingual data and target to get more signals here. So we end up with having feedback signals to our models from post-reconstruction. Post-models are helping each other here uh, through the reconstruction signals and through the language model. We update our models in an iterative way. And we do that in the mini-batch fashion. Usually we train both models together, take mini-batch from uh, X to Y, another mini-batch from Y to X, mini batch with monolingual sentence X only, another mini batch with Y only, and we keep iterating over and over on that. This assumes that you can back-propagate two variants. Is that we, don't make any hard choices in the model? Theoretically, you can uh, train both systems together. Practically, you can freeze one of them if you wish. Okay. But so, uh, yeah, I guess in practice, what do you do? In practice, we started doing training both together, OK? And that is OK, but it takes longer time to convert. You can freeze the other model if you are not interested in that. 
after some iterations and keep training that model only if you are training, if you are interested more in the x, y direction. If you're interested more, you can still keep training. Practically, I would freeze that and after a while and keep training the other one just for faster conversion. Okay, the other uh, approach we can start with doing the supervised learning. And in supervised learning here, we don't depend on the external signal. In other words, we don't assume that we have unlabeled data in X or unlabeled data in Y. We just assume that we have two models that is exploring the duality and we let them help each other. First, we start with the prime model again from X to Y and we have the other dual task from y to x. Here's the constraint that both of them, again, are representing the joint x to y probability. Then, if we are really presenting the same joint probability, both models should agree together. Somehow, we can force that into our loss function by minimizing the difference between the joint probability of the two models. And we keep iterating that during our uh, training, and that way we can seek agreement between both directions of uh, both models together. That is very helpful actually because usually you have different views from X to Y or other Y to X, especially in two distance language like Chinese for English, for example, different reordering, different uh, linguistics problems. So having both models to agree with each other on some uh, methodological way is very important here. Uh, what we do usually is actually we, uh, we try both approaches together, dual supervised learning, dual unsupervised learning in the same uh, training framework and we keep updating our parameters using both uh, uh, loss functions depending on the direction and depending on the data we have. So here we simply the feedback signal is the reconstruction uh, uh, loss between the two directions and we try to minimize the gap between the two joint distributions. Okay, so far we have uh, like uh, uh, we have seen the dual supervised learning. You can uh, imagine that we can do that in batch mode, as you asked. It. Like maybe we can freeze the two models. If we freeze the two models and we keep doing that in more iterative way, there's two advantages here. First, it's easier at training time because you can freeze the model, then do that uh, uh, dual translation, update the two models, and re-update again and do that in more iterative way. And that we can, we can explore like that. We start between uh, the D data is the parallel data. We start training initial systems using the parallel data only. After the first iteration, full training, full conversion for the post systems, we translate uh, synthetic data, X and Y, from the monolingual corpus along with the scores or the weights that the systems are providing for those translation. And once we do that, we can take that data again, train another model using the training data parallel one, the synthetic data that has some rewards or score, and keep doing that. Uh, in contrast with the uh, previous approach here, we are freezing the whole model, producing data, then producing another model. First, the advantage here is that you can reduce the, uh, the gradient noise because you are propagating on the whole system once using, you freezing that system, you freezing that system, then producing some data with scores, so you are reducing the uh, noise in the gradient. And then you keep doing that in three or four iterations on the whole system. The score, yes. Or from the other system. Okay. Um, how do you, what, is there any difference between the way you use um, the input from the synthetic or like the automated uh, translations and the uh, human translations? Yeah, the human translation has weight one, which we trust 100%. The uh, system generated have the weight coming from the original system that produced it. The loss is here. It is here. Yeah. You can see it is here. So the first term in the loss function is the parallel data loss. The second term we replace the monolingual uh, uh, loss function because we are sampling from the translation system in the other direction. And the 
translation system from the other direction give us a score for that particular sentence and we keep updating our model based on both bilingual loss function and the sample loss function from the actual system, the second system. So both systems are jointly training each other. It is very uh, uh, theoretically close to the online dual learning that we described before, but on the online dual learning we are doing that on every mini batch we are doing that iterations for updating. Here we freeze the two systems, produce data with the scores, update another system and so on. You can think it is more stable during training. We have some results to compare each other, uh, but we eventually found they are complementary actually. So, so far we uh, explored the dual nature of translation with three approaches, dual learning supervised, unsupervised, along with joint training. Second, we will explore the uh, second problem we have here, which is uh, the uh, exposure bias or the bias toward uh, left-right translation. In all machine translation, we depend on beam search, and we, even without the beam search, we produce the left words, then we keep propagating till the right side. At training time, we get the truth, 100% true at uh, training time, but at decoding time, we may produce an error that can propagate eventually, especially with very long sentences, it can propagate towards the end. And that is a problem that we notice it is very, very uh, noticeable on the very long sentences. So how we can like reduce that exposure, uh, we try two different approaches to handle that limitation. First, what if we do a dual decoding? Like instead of decoding, the sentence once, we can decode it twice. That is very intuitive even for the human cognition. When you are trying to translate some sentence, you found a word in the middle that you really don't know the sense for that. Then you keep translating the whole sentence till the end and revise your translation. So the model to do that is dual path decoding. First we have encoder as usual, then we do first path decoding. In the first path decoding, we don't actually produce the final word, but before the softmax layer, we take the last uh, uh, representation that we got for the decoder and feed both the encoder output, first pass decoder, to a second pass decoder here. In more concrete representation here, consider that it's similar to the transformer models we have. We start with the encoder, we get attention from the encoder side, then we produce the output state for the decoder itself step by step. And then, that is the first path decoder, we end up with output states for rough estimation for the sentence so far. Then, we produce a second path decoder, it takes the input encoder, everything, apply attention on it again, take all the first path decoder, apply attention on each word again, both of them represent the second path decoder state. If you recall in the original uh, transformer description, we were very careful not to look ahead, not to look because we mask the uh, multi-head attention to not look at the right because it is not seen so far. In that approach, it enabled us actually to pay attention to the whole encoder sentence and the whole first path decoder because that's two paths already. So we see even to our right and to our left, whenever, whenever we are producing any word in the middle, we can see the whole scope of the first path decoder. And that helps a lot on refining the translation in uh, two path decoding fashion. Any question? So is it potentially the argmax, the first path? Like what is that is before the softmax. Yeah, that is a, because this model is trained before. We trained that for some steps for conversion, not conversion, but we trained the first path decoding first on the output actually, and then we train both together for more iteration. But at runtime, we don't use the actual Y. We just use the, uh, the output state before the softmax as uh, input to another attention between the second path decoder and the first path decoder. Any questions so far? Okay, again, you can imagine that 
Here maybe you are doing too bad decoding, maybe computationally it is expensive because it is double the cost at decoding time. Can we think of a way of doing that at training time? So where we can get the signal at training time? Here we get the signal from seeing the whole source sentence, rough estimation for the whole target sentence. It, it is still straightforward to do that at training time because we can seek some signals from translating a model that going left to right, producing the first English word first, and another model that actually reverse model right to left, producing the last English words first. And this actually uh, similar to the actual path problem we described, but here we try to seek agreement between both left and right model, as well as a right to left model. Then if we can find a way to modify our objective or training uh, loss to accommodate both together, right to left, left to right, maybe we can uh, reach some agreement between both models and reduce our bias. And we do that in very similar way to the iterative way we did in the joint training. But here, we are not doing uh, joint training between two models, Chinese to English, English to Chinese. Instead, we are doing that for a model doing uh, Chinese English, as usual, and another model producing the English in the reverse way. And then we reduce the bias between both systems that way. Still, we need to accommodate that uh, loss in our loss function. And for that, we handle it as a regularization using KL diversion. The first item in the loss function is the actual parallel uh, sentence loss function. The second here is a KL uh, uh, distance between the model that producing the uh, to the left means the arrow is going left means the reverse direction and it's agreement with the model producing the same sentence with the going in left to right direction the third item here is another KL similarity or KL distance between the model producing the same sentence from left to right and the model producing the same sentence from right to left. So both terms together in additive mode can be considered as a regularization term that tries to discourage the models if they are disagreeing on how both sequence or streams are coming to each other and reward the model more if both sentences are in agreement from left to right, right to left. So uh, we start. We, we have at least reviewed some of the uh, uh, models so far. So that is the result we got so far, using whatever we discussed. So we have dual learning, uh, dual path decoding, agreement regularization, joint training, and back translation. We start comparing on the WMT 2017 test set, and the first system is the winner on the last uh, WMT evaluation. It is not a single system, it is ensemble and system combination ranking, but we are putting here, here just for comparison only. And as you can see from the baseline, we are doing okay. Adding back translation, we are one and a half blue points more than that. And then we start step by step trying different combination. All of those are single systems, but with different techniques combined together. Step by step, we try to see the impact of each one of them. So uh, the dual learning plus deliberation networks are doing quite uh, well, 27.4. And all of those single systems are actually state of the art compared to the last WMT evaluation. Uh, dual learning is doing a little bit better than agreement regularization, but you can see all of them are actually equally uh, good altogether. Still, we are not yet there. Uh, to match any human parity using that. All our setup now so far is using the official uh, training data from WMT 17, which is about 25 million sentences plus monolingual corpus. We ended up here uh, after the back translation and the dual learning with about 35 million sentences, which is the official training uh, data available. Then we uh, moved our attention to what if we want to actually uh, increase our training data a lot? And that comes with problems. We have more training data from WebCrowd, hundreds of millions of sentences, 
Most of them are very noisy. Most of them are bad translation, partial translation, out of domain, and so on. So we thought maybe we can find a way to filter this data in a better way. Traditionally, like cross entropy difference is the uh, like de facto approach for filtering training data, but it comes with its limitations that match any gram probabilities on both source and target and have a distance to compute them together. Uh, we found that is, it is inadequate for that uh, task and usually not producing uh, um, uh, enough varieties of the data to get better quality on the translation systems. So we thought that if we can represent our uh, sentence, both source and target, in some uh, uh, bilingual space, in other ways, if I give you a sentence in Chinese, another sentence in English, if both of them have the same exact representation, then we can measure the distance between both of them. And that is actually what is a bilingual encoder-decoder system following the multilingual uh, NMT would be doing. So we train a system with English to Chinese as source, as well as the Chinese to English as a target. Both of them are uh, melted together without any language marker or nothing. So the system wouldn't know if the input is English or Chinese. We end up with a sentence level representation for both sentences, regardless of the uh, original uh, language of the sentence. At runtime or at selection time, we end up running the encoder part only of that system having a sentence vector representation and simply calculate the cosine uh, similarity between both of them. And that enabled us to uh, filter out a lot of the noisy data because that particular score is very sensitive, for example, for the partial translation, the very noisy translation. If you crawl data from the web, you find data that is, has been translated by machine translation systems 10 years ago, very bad quality, very noisy, and that really, really hurt the system. So eventually we use that to filter out our data. Uh, yeah, and so far that is the uh, data selection uh, result. So again, we compare with the baselines we have uh, before. And uh, base 8K is very large transformer architecture. When we use 8,000 dimension for the feedforward network, it proved to be very, very helpful for the large amount of data though you have to tune the dropout a little bit to get it to perform well. And we experimented here by adding more data up to 70 million or uh, 85 million. And as we can see, the systems are getting quite uh, good improvements there. So far, we ended with many systems, like tens of systems with different configuration, another 10 systems here. Then, um, we decided that maybe we can benefit from just re-ranking of the NPS list from all the systems. Very similar straightforward approach that we use held out data to tune some features to rank the NPS from each system. Right. Uh, how can you measure the larger data on your best systems as opposed to the slowest to do the um, ranking? We, no, it is, it is doable. Yeah, we did that after that actually. But, uh, but at that time, it was, I would say, parallel exploration passes that one path exploring, filtering the data, the other path exploring the dual path, and it was separate system at that time. Uh, now, no, we have, we have it retrained using the larger data. You can imagine um, the whole, uh, like, uh, if we see the results here, we have like 27.6, but you see the results here, actually. We get 27.4. It is not additive. We have here one blue point more. We have there one blue point more. We don't get two blue points putting both together. Larger systems, uh, sometimes harder to train, harder in parameters. But you still get some additive uh, 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 improvement, but not linear, for sure. Yeah, so after that, we had to reproduce all those larger systems on the other techniques. There's some uh, different results, but again, it is quite uh, better. Yeah. So here, that is the sentence level ranking. We just define some features on the sentence level. 
train those features using held out data they set, re-rank our NPEST. And we explored many, many features. Original system score, identity which system with which score produced that uh, hypothesis, simple five gram language model, uh, rescoring the sentence with another system that's going from the other direction. It's still, though most of those systems have a lot of right to left regularization and a lot of dual regularization, it still benefits from even seeing a signal at combination time that penalizes the disagreement. And that can open a lot of questions there is still a space for improving on those uh, duality issues, uh, directionality issues, or right to left bias. Because even using those features still, we can pick better sentence rather than the original system picked. And uh, the last three features are back composition, for example. We reverse the output of the system to the other direction again and compute the sentence vector similarity between the back composed sentence and the original one and so on. So that is seven, eight features, I think, maybe more. <coughs> is there more detail in the paper on that actually? And we end up with having a system combination. All those are different variation of the systems we discussed before. And the second half of that table all are all actually achieving uh, state of the art human uh, parity scores. As you can see, the system combination can give us up to one blue point with single reference on that data sets getting one blue point using system combination is quite challenging. So again, that open uh, good space for questions, how we can make single system the benefit from most of those approaches to give, which is still, still an open research question. So we turn our focus now into how we can uh, calculate the human evaluation. As I said, that is very challenging uh, problem, still very questionable, even uh, we have a lot of details in the paper why we define it like that, still questionable by uh, uh, machine translation community, especially human translators. So the first criteria, what if I give you two different sentences and you tell me they are equivalent? That's very hard because equivalence in translation is not that easy to define. So if the human judge can uh, say, uh, qualify that post-translation system or human or two systems are equivalent to each other, that's very easy. But it's very hard to get a human to tell you that two sentences are really equivalent to each other. So the other approach is that we may say, if we can achieve a measure that tell us both systems or both uh, sentences or a human translation, system translation, are not distinguishable from each other. In other way, if we sample enough samples using, using human annotators, we can tell if that is system A or system B, we can tell if it is human or machine. And we adopted that particular definition. First, it gave us uh, advantage that we can sample a lot of samples there and uh, you can, using uh, uh, many annotators, you can be more sure are you on good match or not. Uh, second, it relieves us from having to define a single criteria to define two sentences as equivalent to each other. So we moved from having equality to being not able to distinguish between human and the translation. No, we don't ask the person to annotate human versus translation, and we don't uh, ask the person to even, the person not supposed to know if it is human or machine translation. So we give the human a Chinese sentence, okay, and give 10 English translation. The 10 English translation can be three humans, other humans, three other systems, four other production systems, whatever. Just 10 variation of that. And the human, each human see only one translation bears the Chinese sense, only one. And will, no reference. He doesn't see the English reference at all. He just see an English translation provided by a human or a system. Then he will decide how good or bad from a zero to 100 scale 
that translation conveying the semantic, syntactic meaning of that. The annotator is bilingual, no Chinese, no English, or bilingual translator, professional. Then uh, he doesn't see the reference, he doesn't see the other system. Just give one sentence space, only seeing the Chinese, how good or bad you think it is. If you aggregate a lot of those samples for many annotators, then statistically you may have good uh, like uh, uh, conclusion on how it goes. For that is inequality. We can't distinguish between them, but that not, doesn't mean they are equivalent. Just we don't know. Okay. So why not using blue? Actually, blue is not uh, bad as people think. <laughs> and uh, and when like uh, I used to work with Kishur Pabinini, the inventor of blue score, and around 2005 he said. I think after two years, people will come with another metric that will help us just to go through two years. After two, three years, people will definitely come with a new metric. And till now, there is no metric other than below that people trust. But I do think that the machine translation community actually abused the blue a little bit. We started with three, four very good references that we evaluate with when the uh, uh, NIST evaluations and DARPA evaluations started very neat for references. Then people start to get, okay, maybe we don't need four reference, maybe one reference is okay. And that start to be, uh, the, to be in the wrong direction because one reference can be wrong. Second, people started in WMT evaluation in particular to have crowdsourced references, which means that the reference even is not accurate, is not clean full of errors, full of mistakes, and we spend a lot of time trying to chase uh, a moving target there. So uh, bad references, uh, single references, all limitations that can uh, give below a disadvantage. So here we can compare like online B, online B is Google actually, online A is us, and the uh, official WMT uh, test set is uh, blue one, the uh, dark blue or black and the green are two references that we created. One of them is post-edited, like we allow the people to use the translation system post-edited. The green one is 100% human edited without any post-editing or translation system. As you can see, the official uh, uh, WMT reference as well as the post-edited reference are scoring very, very high on blue score, while not on the other system. In our human evaluation, as well as in the WMT last year evaluation, both online A and online B scored the worst on human quality on the same data set. So that means this blue score is very biased because of the post editing problem there. So again, if we have three of those green references, maybe we can have better scoring, but as we learn it eventually that the noise and the quality of the reference matter a lot. For that, when we asked the human to evaluate the uh, translation, we didn't show them the reference at all. They just see Chinese and translation, and maybe they see one of those references in between as one of the systems. They don't recognize if it is a system or a translation. Okay, so that is the interface that is uh, uh, Christian Federman, our colleague, uh, developed in a system called Appraise. It is on GitHub and it is used by WMT now. You can see some sentence and another sentence and you just give a score from how uh, uh, does the above candidate uh, like convey the original semantic and the meaning. The example here is showing the reference, but what we did is source only. He sees the source and sees the translation in bilingual. Here, it's just for illustration only. And they just slide that bar. Then, because that is very uh, not well defined, what sliding a bar means from 0 to 100, you have to aggregate a lot of data points for this to make sure that you are averaging some uh, quantitative metrics there. You know, we conducted most monthly evaluations uh, on the systems and yeah, maybe we are having a lot of internal names here, so don't care about all those internal naming. 
But at the end, we did some monthly evaluation, seeing how the systems are moving around. And the evaluation is done by, uh, it is blind, blind actually evaluation by a committee that is not participating in developing the systems at all. Uh, they don't know which system they are evaluating. They don't know what is the identity of the system, just random sentence to give a score to. Around mid-February, late February, we got some better scores. This is quite confusing, but you can consider that the first cluster of systems are all outperforming all other systems. And if the systems are in the same cluster, that means you can't distinguish between uh, uh, them together. In other ways, there is no significant difference between Combo 6 reference HD and Combo 5, Combo 4 reference PE. And that is by definition, you can say that this achieves the human parity because three systems from the uh, uh, output are matching the human performance. It is a little hard to interpret such tables, but uh, in the paper there is a lot of details, and you can see some different view here. For example, that is the distribution of the scores we collected for a particular evaluation campaign. For particular evaluation, you send 100 sentences from each system to uh, um, three different uh, annotators, and then you repeat that three other times. So you end up with 900 annotations per system. You have 10 systems, that is 9,000 annotations per uh, single evaluation. Then that is the scores, the raw score that the annotator would pick and you can see that the uh, systems combo six mean here is quite better than the WMT uh, evaluation uh, new tested itself. If we see another view here, combo six compared to the post editing, we see they are closer actually, and the curves are almost matching on the distribution of the human evaluation. If we compare that system to the human translation, which is 100% not post edited, we see they are almost a match, and that, by definition, can uh, define what is human parity according to this definition. We are not claiming that is the only single definition for human parity. I think people will come with other definition, hopefully not like uh, happened with flu, but I think eventually we can have better understanding how we measure human uh, performance in translation. Uh, what's the WMT? The WMT is the official, there's serial from WMT, the official uh, uh, WMT uh, uh, test set reference, 2017. And we created other two, which is one post edited, BE, and 100% human translation. So uh, I suppose the WMT evaluation used crowdsourcing to. That is was, that is was crowdsourced, and for that it is less quality than the others. That is still. Uh, both edited, but with a lot of uh, uh, control on the quality. And that is 100% human. Very expensive to get, by the way, for that people. Like, it is very expensive to have uh, real translators who commit to do 100% translation without touching this. And that's it. So we have a, a mechanism to filter out evaluators. Like at the beginning of each campaign, we put artificial data that we know the answer, answer for it. And we embed that into the data first. If the annotator is just going random, we figure that out early and reject that annotator. So the factor of the annotator noise is a little bit out of the equation given that uh, mechanism. But there is two sorts of uh, problems here. First, the translation itself may be wrong. Second, the directionality of the original source of the test sets, the ratio you raised earlier. Uh, it is mixed between Chinese to English and reversed English to Chinese. Okay, so half of the test set is originally Chinese news. The other half is original English news. And if the original English news translated with not that good Chinese, 
then the source will not be 100% conveying the meaning. Even if you are really doing good job in translation, the human will see a source, noisy, not that good, and even a better translation. It doesn't matter at that time, he will evaluate it badly. And that is one, so we have, we have some tables measuring that, and all this data is publicly available for measuring the annotation, I mean. So we release that data uh, for the whole annotation, that is thousands of annotations. That still, I think it can be very helpful on evaluating how machine translation is doing. Uh, we, yeah, we have a lot of still work going on, trying to push forward into how to measure human parity. Uh, furthermore, there is still a lot of open issues for uh, the neural machine translation. The recent progress was a result of whatever the whole research community uh, 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 did through the couple of last years. And we still a lot of open questions or issues here. Uh, the rare problems out of vocabulary, named entities, all that are very important issue to tackle. Low resource languages. Uh, here we are using 70 and 80 million sentences in the news domain, and that is not widely available for many of the other languages. I would say that only available for maybe 10 top languages only. What about the low resource languages? Domain and topic, here it is news. Very, if you read the news from 10 years ago, it will be very similar to today. So it is very easy domain, I would say. The language are distance, but the domain is easy. Document level, we are not using any document level context information to guide our translation. Even if you are translating a dialogue, we are not, we don't know. Like if someone saying you, would you like to travel by air or train? You said air. And then if you translate that air, you will never translate that air as the aeroplane. It will be translated. So we are not using the context at all. And I hope the research community will move towards using more contextual information. Multimodality, text, speech, video, emotions, everything we have uh, with the text, it's not just text. And uh, we reviewed three different architectures. We think all of them can come together for a better architecture. Uh, last but not least, have to model the reasoning and understanding of the language. Now we are just matching big chunks to big other, sh other chunks because of a lot of data. We don't know anything about what is the predicate argument structure, how it moves there, what is the semantic uh, carried over or not. All that are very open uh, research issues that we hope the research community will move forward to. Thanks, and uh, I think. Uh,